Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jared, and we're going to be reviewing the new updates for the Vizzy 2023.1 release. This will be for the CAM side, so we'll open up the floor to question and answer at the end, but we're going to review some of the features. So let's get started. Hexcon support. We offer on-site and web training. Our helpline has changed from last year. So our new phone number is 248-255-4348. Our email address is tst.support.mi at hexagon.com. Or you can also access the Hexagon customer portal to email us with support questions. We offer tech days such as this with our webinar going over the new features. And as you probably already know, we have an unmatched level of support and services. So what is the Hexagon customer portal? This is an easy way of accessing your software licenses. This allows you to access software licenses for the entire company. It's also an easy way of being able to submit support cases, track your cases, see the status of the cases. And it's also your way of accessing the latest version of the software. So any patch updates, any new releases will be available through the software tab here. So it's never been easier to access us via remote support. So with Hexagon, we have introduced a new application called TeamViewer. So the TeamViewer Quick Support app is automatically installed with your Visi software. There's two ways of accessing it. Right through the software, through the question mark dropdown, same area you access query, via remote support, and also through the Visi launcher. So once you have the su support for TeamViewer app up, all you have to do is just give us your ID and password, and we will be logged into your system to help you out with any help desk needs. Within our technical support services, as mentioned before, we offer many different services, such as installation and training on new softwares, transferring all your tool libraries, your tool settings, and any custom components. Within the 2023 update, we can come on site, we can do this over the web, and we can help you get up and running on the latest software. So from here, we're going to go over the agenda of what we're planning on covering. So we'll start off with the installation computer prerequisites. We'll go through translators. We'll go through the user interface improvements, drafting and modeling, surfacing, analysis, the VisiCam general improvements, 2-axis cam, 3-axis cam, 5-axis cam, and wire EDM. So we're going to go into the installation and prerequisites. So within the installation, uh, it still requires Windows 10 or Windows 11 Pro to be installed and also is only supported with the 64-bit version. So talk about previous compatibility. Visi 2022.1 files can be open in 2023. However, once saved in 2023, it is not backwards compatible. So as you can see, the icons and splash screen have changed between 2022.1 and 2023. So we're going to talk about some of the new updates to the translators in 2023.1. So highlighted here are the new import translators. These are the ones highlighted in green. Then here are some of our new export translators. So we're going to talk about these more in detail here. So probably one of the biggest translator updates is the ability to support more 2D formats. So some of the formats that are now supported in 2023.1 are your Katia drawing files, your Creo drawing files, NX drawing files, Solid Edge drawing files, and probably the biggest one is SolidWorks drawing files. So you have the ability to bring in these 2D files with the alternative library. And basically, here's how you would switch that alternative library. So this is a really big enhancement requested by many for years, and now it's in the software. So there's also another translator supported update for the .obj format. So this is basically like a format for supporting any kind of mesh type of data for UV positions, for uh, vertex normals, vertex faces, and so on. And then also the jpeg.jpeg extension is now supported within the merge options. So now we're going to go into some of the new user interface updates. So the menu options have changed a little bit in 2023.1. So 
basically here's just some of the drop downs. So the main big ones I've noticed that have changed are the operation blends have now been moved to modeling blends and the cut bodies have been moved to operations. So there's just been some cleanup work with some of the command drop downs. So as you can see, here's just a drop down of some of those changes. A lot of the icons have been fully updated in this version as well. So there is a new big enhancement to the 2023.1 and there's standard and extended modes. In the standard default mode, a simplified list of commands have been shown. So the most common commands that are used are within the standard menu. The option is intended to clean up the interface and make it easier for newer users to learn the software. So this is very, very important to users that have used the software for a while. There is in the system settings area, a drop down called extended user mode. You will want to have this checked with one busy session open to be able to bring back the full menu options. So if there's commands that you're used to seeing and you notice that they're missing, this is very important to check on. Again, very, very important. So we'll talk about some of the command toolbars. So command toolbars can be defined as floating, docked, or hidden. In the floating mode, the contextual menu fillet toolbar is automatically resized as well. So you can see here's your floating toolbars. So you have the ability to actually make these toolbars transparent or not through the system settings user interface options. And you have the ability to show, hide, reset the toolbars as you choose to as well and bring it back to like how the older versions worked. But this floating toolbar box allows you to use more of the interface as well. So here's just a drop down to say show hide and this would bring back your styles the way you used to see them. So within the toolbar list, there are now two submenus. So if you right click on the icon bar list, you can see two submenus. So there's A through P and Q through W. This basically prevents that drop down from being a full large list. So here's just a video example going over some of these. So you can see how the menu options have changed. You can see how it kind of reduces the size of the drop downs, making a nice cleaner look. So if we go to the system settings area, you can see how there's an extended user mode right now. If you check that box, this will actually bring up the drop downs, much like how you used to see them before. So you can see how it's got a much longer list of commands. Some of the commands may look like they're missing, but you just have to check that extended user mode. So here's your show icon bars. You can turn this on and off. You can say show hidden icon bars and actually bring up the normal menu or you can say hide icon bars and say show command icons. And this brings up those icon bars as floating dialog boxes. They can move to, be moved around, put on a second screen if you choose to. And there's basically two icon bars. You can see one that's the primary icon bar that you're used to seeing. And the second one's this, the command icon bar. You can see how there's a floating dialog transparency box that you can slide on and off. So here's where the floating dialog boxes show A through P, Q through W, and it reduces that large list that's shown. Hood flyout commands. So you can actually apply multiple commands to one individual hood flyout. This is available within the system settings graphic icon area layouts. And as you can see, you can actually add multiple commands to different commands. For example, the shaded command, the analysis commands, and so on. There's a new toggle switch button called display face color. This will allow you to toggle on face colors and toggle them off as well. And there's a new toggle switch button for the region creation. You can toggle this on and off to be able to view closed areas on the work plane. The VC units of measurement are actually going to be saved with your default measurements, not the last file used. And within docking dialog management, there's actually a new icon to be able to force a floating dialog box or not. So this icon looks just like this right here. And this is basically a new command to be able to dock and undock your area without having to do a right click. So there's also some new options within collapsible frames within any graphics icon command. So you can actually expand and collapse different frames as needed for commands you use over and over versus not to make the dialog box smaller. 
within graphic mode, you can now retain your shading hemlines inside of your file. So for example, when you save and close it, you can reload it. It is not necessary to have these in defined inside of a preview file as well. And in some cases, the shading is loaded without that preview file. So there's a new option within system settings called retain graphic modes on file load. Then right click to confirm. You now have the ability to actually right click and confirm within the dialog box that you're actually applying a command to. You don't have to have your cursor in the graphic area anymore. Within Visi Fonts, you now have the ability to display the default Visi font from the status bar menu and toolbars. There is a new option to use fixed spacing, and these options are actually under the System, System Options, User Interface area. Within Tooltips, if you hover over an area of your message area, and let's say that area isn't big enough to show all the font, if you hover over it, you get this little message area that shows you the full explanation of what it's looking for. Speaking of the message area, it is now possible to display the message area right on your interface area. So as you can see, there is the message area that displays right in front of you. This makes it easier for you to be able to see exactly what the command is looking for, and it's right in the foreground. Within your context menu, it is possible to drag or, with a right-click pre-select, move your contextual icon bars. Basically, you can also pick an empty part of the toolbar to move it as well as a blue ribbon bar as well. And within the command search, it's become more visible. As you can see, there's a highlight on the command search bar. So if you don't know where a command is at, you can always search for it. So here's just a quick video showing you some of these different explanations. So here is your multiple icons in the graphic area. You can see how you can actually set multiple different icons for these subgroups. These are all customizable. So you can see how I have a headline area as well. I can change my views to whatever I want them to be. And you can see how the isometrics all have different alignments. We also have display face colors. So you actually have a toggle switch now within the icon area that you can quickly toggle face colors on and off if you choose to. And within cuboid, you can see how here's your tooltip area. You can highlight over the area and see the message area. And then you can also see that message area at the very top, the help panel. So these areas can be turned off. There, that message area can be turned off by going into system settings and you just basically check or uncheck show command message panel. You do not want it in the foreground. We're going to go into pick and selection. It is possible to now do a pick and selection on an intersection point in the middle of two faces. You can see how the intersection point between the two faces actually will now display an edge, which makes it selectable for any commands that involve a point environment. Within your selection set, it is now possible to rename your selection. So in the previous version, they introduced the selection set. So you have a group of faces you want to constantly select over and over and over again without actually having to reselect all of the faces. And inside of enhanced pick, you now have the ability to do an enhanced pick and type in some incremental values on a face. And you can actually turn on and off that incremental value area by using the L key. Within pick point, it is now possible to press the enter key if you want to automatically have that point display on the current work plane and the O key if you want it to display on the absolute. And within facet mesh shading, all commands are available within this shading option, so no longer will they be grayed out. You now have the ability to dynamically create a work plane just by simply highlighting the work plane on the bottom left corner and just doing a simple drag of it. This will bring up the automatic work plane orientation where it'll allow you to create a work plane right from the existing work plane. You have the ability to rotate or do whatever you need to do with the work plane. Here's just a quick video. So I have a solid block and a couple of surfaces that are intersecting each other. You can see how where these blocks are intersecting, it allows me to actually use a point environment command to actually pick that intersection area. So as you can see, it is allowing me to select it. This can also work great for anything else. So if I go to sketch line right now, I'm actually highlighted over a face. I could type in a value from that face. Previously, I had to move my cursor off of the face to be able to type in the value I wanted. Now I don't have to. And here's our dynamic work plane. Basically, I'm just simply holding my left mouse over that work plane to be able to create a work plane. It gives me the automatic work plane orientation where I can save it and instantly save a work plane right from that dialog. 
There have been several enhancements to the translation command. In incremental translation, when you select a part, the slider is placed on the closest relevant point for your select on the part. For example, the vertex, middle point, or edge, the middle point of a face, the center of a circle arc, and so on. This is particularly useful for applications like, for example, with a roto translation of a part where you will avoid having to use the slider axis to be able to do this. This also is relevant to using the Alt key. The inserted value for the slider of the increment is positioned closest to the slider. After any change, the slider will reset to zero in order to consider the next inserted value. The closest slider axis is aligned to the selected direction. And here's just a couple pictures and a quick video showing this. So if I go to edit translation, I pick as close to the bottom left corner and you can see how my slider shows up on that bottom left corner. But now I'll pick on the top right corner and you can see how it's showing on the right side. And if I pick in the center, you can see how the incremental translation actually picks there. So now we'll go off of something with an angle as an example. So like if I go ahead and pick on this edge, you can say select direction. And if I pick the edge itself, it automatically changes the increment value in relevance to that edge. So if I do a translation, it's actually doing the translation in relevance to that direction. There's been some new enhancements to the rotation command. The commonly used rotation angles have been actually placed into a drop down dialog. These are applied to the rotation, the pattern, rotation and pattern radial. So as you can see there's an angle list and the most common angles that you put in there you can just choose it from a drop down rather than have to type the angle in if you choose to. Within color palette it is now possible to restore the original color palettes on a save and load of a custom color palette. This is useful for when you're working on customer data that is specifically based on a certain color scheme. And in orthogonal view you have the ability to do point snapping along an extension line to mark the appropriate Z direction. And the marking of the origin point is also swapped to XZ plane and is possible to snap along the Z direction. This is the same for the YZ plane. In previous versions, you always had to snap to the X or the Y regardless of the plane itself. Within change attributes, it is now possible to assign a reference name to any entities. This name is displayed in Query, and then also later on, if you're doing any kind of machining, it's also displayed there as well. There is now a new Reset Face Transparency option when working on solids. This works like the Reset Color and Reset Face Colors as well. And there's a new enhancement to be able to display a work plane name. In System Settings Graphics, there's a new callout called Show Work Plane Name. In the graphical area, it will display the work plane. It is now also possible to define work planes by a color. So you could actually select a relative work plane and change the color of that work plane as well. So here's just a quick uh, example of the reference names. So if I select this, op or this dialog right here, and you can see there's a reference name. I could type in a name to whatever I want. So main strip, for example, and then I could do a secondary strip. So if I go ahead and confirm that, and I go to query, as an example, I can select that area. And you can see how the reference name now displays within the query area. Going off of the create work plane, you can display a work plane name. So I'm just going to create a work plane real quick in this corner here. So whatever the work plane name is that I want, I'll just leave it as WPL. And under system settings, under the graphics area, you can actually show the work plane name just by simply doing a checkbox. So you can see how that work plane name is now displayed there. And basically that work plane name is now going to be on file. You can also change the work plane reference color too, which is also big to separate out your work planes. So if you change the work plane reference color, you can select it, you can go ahead and hit confirm, and now that work plane is actually a different color. So you can separate all of your relative work planes based on specific colors. So I'll go into drafting and modeling. So within the blend with curves command, there's a new trim option, which allows you to trim at the nearest edge that you selected. So there's a slider that is available to manage the tangent scale as well.
with an offset elements, it is now possible to be able to create and select an edge to avoid extracting any wireframe. You have touching elements, not concatenated, which are offset on the same side. And you also have an option to use create profile and offset. And you have another option called close boundary, which allows you to create a close boundary. This option also allows you to create that close boundary as an arc or a segment. So let's start with the blend with curve command. You can see how you can select your curve. We're selecting approximate areas and we have this checkbox called trim. If you check and uncheck that box, it'll either retain the extra lines as the extend or even better, if I go to select those extra lines, and I select trim, it actually gets rid of them. So if I'm picking an approximation point between two lines, I can actually trim them along that curve. So now we'll go into the offset elements option. If you go ahead and select these areas, you can see how we have both sides. You can see how we have the option close boundary just below both sides. And that's basically this option right here. So when we have that option, either on both sides or close boundary, we can create that into a close profile. So if we have closed boundaries, we can select closed profile and that'll create it into a closed profile. We can also do it by segments or by arcs. This creates a slot shape around those areas. So within closed profile, the icon manual selection is available right at the start of the command. In this way, it is possible to do a manual selection before even having to select a first element. There's been some improvements with the vector text within this version as well. So when you are actually inserting in text, you now can preview the text as you're doing an insertion. Previously, you just pick a point and then you'd see your text. Now you see the preview of it, which is very, very nice. The command dialog has been updated with collapsible frames as well. And the command dialog is either docked or floating, pending on your modeling commands and docked area. Within matrix point sets, there's been a few new options added as well, such as application points, distance mode, and grouping of options for base and vertical and specific frames. Within pattern translate, it is now possible to do a translation of an open pocket within your dialog. And within pattern mirror, you have the create feature options or create feature instances within the options dialog too. So within Chamfer, it is now possible to define the limit options. So just like with Blend, you now can set limits within the Chamfer command as well. And Offset Hollow Bodies it is now possible to offset faces. And then when you're offsetting faces, adding a blend edge to an extension face of a convexed edge. And within Extrude Elements, the Retain Original Elements option is on and is used by the Extrude op Operations. So here's just a quick video it's just showing the chamfer command here. So if I select an edge, I can change the uh, distance and I can set a limit to it. So I can set a limit by points, by entities, or by planes, much like how the blend command functioned in the previous version as well. So you can see how I can drag this chamfer around to wherever I want it to go. Under the offset hollow bodies, I now can pick faces. So as you can see, I'm selecting these faces here. So I can set the offset for those specific faces, creating a surface. I can choose whether these convex edges have a blended edge or not, just by simply checking and unchecking that blend edges area. So within solid forms, in cuboid and cylinder, you can now apply a non-uniform offset when you're creating the cavities, much like how you would do with bounding box. <clears throat> You can add negative values to the offset and highlight the offset within purple areas within the graphic pane. Within Edit Constant Radius Blend, there's been several different enhancements as well. So there is new functionality to be able to delete the blend and throw a cap on top of the blend. Within this cap area, there's enable modes such as planner cap, generic cap, or cup inside of edges. These options are useful when it comes to fixing a complex chain of blends within an area. And in the video that we're about to show you shortly, you will see those options shown. So let's start off with the solid form area real quick. You've got a cuboid. We're going to go ahead and just pick an area for that cuboid to be created, just adding a miscellaneous length and width. And then we'll add a miscellaneous height that actually goes into the part. 
So if I use the collapsible window and change my application point, I can select that area and I can create with subtraction. So I do still have the generic cavity or create cavity option, which allows me to put a generic offset. That's an offset overall for the entire piece. So I'm just changing the size of this a little bit more. And then I can show transparency mode. I'll apply an offset value to this. So you can see how that offset generically goes in all directions. But now we've introduced a new non-default offset. So you can see how we can do the offset just in the length, just in the width, and maintain that height as what it is. You can do a unique positive length, positive width, and it will apply those values as well. So as you can see, it's applying that default offset for that generic block. So if I apply it, the cuboid is created and those other areas are in there as well. So the same thing is true within cylinder. I can go ahead and select cylinder, create my radius, create my height to whatever size I need it to be. Under Boolean operations, I can create sub subtraction, add a generic offset, or you can see how there's a non-uniform offset. Now, obviously the difference between a cylinder versus a cuboid is you've got length and height rather than length, width, and height. So you can apply a unique length, a unique height, instead of doing everything at one time, and also add a positive negative height as well. So you can see how the difference is between each one of those areas. You can see the radius and the actual offsets off of that radius. So go and apply that. And now we'll show our complex blend that we're trying to heal off. So if I go to the edit constant radius blend area, I can use block control and I can pick all these different faces. And you can see how right now it does fail to create. Even if we do propagate over adjacent blends or selecting delete blends, it does fail. But when we select delete blends, I select the cap option. You can select the many different options within the mode area once the cap option is enabled. We have our different drop downs. You can select a generic cap, and you can see the different results between these capped areas. You can also select a cap inside of edges. So you can see how that actually starts to work on the delete and healing of it. It heals some of this, but now with the delete extract faces, we can delete the rest of it. So I'll go ahead and confirm this. We'll select delete extract faces. And basically just pick all of the edges. So when I say pick all the edges, you also want to include that triangular shaped edge where the actual blend stops. So that's why you see those little windows. You can see how we drag window on all sides and basically here's that little triangular shape that the edge leaves behind. Basically once we have this selected, we select delete and heal. You can see how it actually heals off that area much easier. So from here, we'll clean this up a little bit further and you can see how it cleans up that area too. Blend between faces. The blend is created from the default side the face has been picked from. So there's also a quick little toggle option to reverse both the first face and the second face within the interface. So longer do you have to go to the advanced tab to check and uncheck those boxes. So there is a red arrow, arrow that is intended on being the normal face which has been restored to a point. Within male thread, there has been some new attributes added to this as well for the faces used for the male threads. So the attribute is applied to query, surface analyzer, annotation, and commands within plot view. We're now going to go into what's new with surfacing with Visi 2023.1. So we'll start off with pipe surfacing. You now have the ability to create sections when the surface is failing to be able to be created. There's a circular cross that is now able to be applied when it comes to perpendiculars to the pipe surface. So this can be used to create uh, surfaces using commands like auto constraint or lofted surface. This also could be something that could be created on a failure. It is now possible to select wireframe that belongs to a solid group to make a pipe surface. And there's a new function called concatenate to properly manage the pipe surface joining points and elements together when it's not concatenated. So here's just a quick video example showing the pipe surface from a solid group. So you can see how I have a solid group that's associated here. I select pipe surface, I can make this wireframe lines related to that solid group and actually make a pipe surface within that area. So I can create that pipe surface into a solid and actually have it be semi-associated to the area. So now on elements that are not touching, 
you can see how I've got a profile, I've got some wireframe here. You can select this element and it still creates a pipe surface even though it's not touching. You can select multiple faces and you can say concatenate elements. If concatenate elements is unchecked, it will actually make separate bodies out of it. If they are checked, it'll make one body out of it. So multiple faces, concatenate elements, you can select these to concatenate and change up the way the pipe surface works. With a thick surface, there have been some new options added for managing the thickness distance. You have the ability to say apply on both sides as well as reverse side. So with the thickness management and other commands, such as auto constrain, one drive by two shapes, pipe surface, there have been some added options as well, such as reverse side, apply distance on both sides, and back values. With an auto constraint, it is now possible to select a non-trim curve or edge to be able to build a surface off of. There are a few new options within auto constraint. One of them is trim elements at intersection point. This option temporarily trims in a selected element on the nearest point. You also have retain original elements. When this box is checked, it will actually retain the original elements. If this is unchecked, it will dis the original elements will disappear. Within extend surface, it is now possible to do the extension by the short or by a shortened surface by edges. And within fillet surface, it is now possible to work on a solid. And you can also select side edge constraints to determine the shape of the sides of a created surface. Another new option is to keep trimming curves, which has been improved upon, and it allows you to create the trimming curves or retain the trimming curves on either side in case of failures. So here's just a quick video example showing the auto constraint command. So inside of here we select auto constraint. Right now I've got this curve right here and I'm going to also pick these edge constraints. What would normally happen is when you create the surface it would fail on the creation or it would try to create a surface that's too far. With this trim elements at intersection point this allows us to actually automatically trim this in relevance to the edges that were previously selected. So we can also unite this surface to the other surfaces as well. Continuing on with this, I've got some extra wireframe geometry in here. So I could just select this wireframe line, select these wireframe lines as well. I could pick that edge and this edge. Then I could build a surface off of that. And an additional thing I can do is I could say, Here's the trimming elements again. I could also turn off the retain original elements and delete those edges. So let's talk about the fillet surface. So I can now pick edges of an existing model rather than have to have wireframe in there. And you can see how it creates that model from that. So I can turn on and off the side constraints. Basically what that does is that's going to allow me to do some trimming that trims naturally to the edge. You could change the tangency scales as well by doing the drag with these bubbles that are on the screen. And if I go ahead and confirm, it'll confirm. So here's the same exact model on a solid. So again, we're going to select edges, but this time do the tangency. So we'll select the tangency of these edges. We'll pick the edge that we want to retain. Select the same thing on the opposite side. And when I hit preview, you can see how it actually builds that overall surface. So this makes a nice clean surface in between those areas, making it much easier to work with. So again, we can keep the side edge constraints, and that just kind of changes the way the model looks as well. Adjusting the tangency scales as well, and that's going to give us what we're looking for there. So kind of continuing on here, we can go ahead and select, like, let's say this edge and this edge. And this is with surface tangent. You can actually select the side edge constraints. It actually draws wireframe there that could be used for a future surfacing command. Again, changing the constraint areas with that surface tangent area. And we can keep the trimming curve to be able to reuse on a different command. So now we're going to go into the analysis dropdown. What's new in 2023? So there's actually been some big changes to this dropdown. We'll start out with the split line command. So the entire user interface has been completely revamped within this command. It's much easier to use, and it's a much smoother process to be able to change and edit and apply a split line. The same thing is true with the split plane command. You have 
several different enhancement options within this, such as being able to select edges, previous versions, you were only able to pick wireframe. You have an automatic solution calculator, and you have some options to extend the method for the automatic solution, extrude values for the part within a bounding box, and you have the ability to modify the chain after this selection has been done. There's a new slider option as well to be able to pick a chain of edges for the automatic solution as well. So we're going to be playing a video just kind of show you some of these options here. So we'll start off with split line. So if we go to the analysis drop down and we select split line, you can see how we have this part here. And within split line, we select our part, choose the direction just like we normally did. And basically from here, we have similar options to what split line offered before. Automatically um, does our color coding, it'll do isocline curves, imprint shadows, search silhouette, and so on. So you can see there's several different options. You can split the body and see what the body looks like from here as well. And just like with the previous split line command, you can modify a few things. So when you do the display, we can display the first body, display the second body, other, which is the split line, and all of the above. So you can actually go into here and you can start modifying and manipulating this split line area. So you can see some of these circular shapes. We may want to manipulate that and sometimes the search may not give us the best possible solution. So we can add points. So basically I'm going to select the two points right here. Basically that creates a line and that line could automatically be, let's say, an imprinted point. So we're going to select a different set right here. So we're going to select this line. So basically it's like us using sketch line and imprint all within this split line command, which is huge. It saves you a lot of steps. So as you can see, you can see how it automatically does that splitting of the lines. You can remove the redundant values that creates a third line or remove redundant edges. And basically from here, that shows up in other. So you got your first color, second color, and other. So if I say remove redundant edges, you can see how that simplifies those sides out, which makes a cleaner split line. So. Here's another example right here. You can see how there's a line right there. We can say add and remove redundant lines. So we can pick that line and actually it's going to allow us to put another color in there and remove that redundant line. So we have a few additional areas within this as well. Like I said, isolating the bodies. And then you could actually go into saving the split line. So we select save the split line. That's just going to save the split line. So. It looks good in most areas, but some of the areas might need a little bit of cleanup work. You can actually go back into the split line and you can edit the existing split line by just simply selecting it. And this goes back into allowing you to manipulate. So you see how this area is not so ideal. We can pick the actual curve that we want. Or we can actually manipulate and draw a curve that we want and we can remove the redundant curve in there. So this would actually apply the new split line and edit that split line in regards to the entire area. So it splits the body. It is a lot easier and a lot more user friendly versus the older style of doing it. And so now we're going to go into split plane, which is also a lot easier, a lot more user friendly when it comes to your selection. So we're picking edges. This is a brand new function to the split plane option. You will create your relief and shut off surfaces for a mold. So you can see how it color codes everything. It automatically separates bodies out and it basically separates out our planes, letting you know which plane is to which direction. So we can actually add slider movements. This adds additional planes to what the system automatically recognized. So I could select like, let's say from this point to this point, and that could be considered a separate plane. We can select all of those additional points. You can see how the face colors color code to the relevant plane changes that we've been making. So we can also choose to take out that surface and possibly remake that surface maybe in a different direction or something along those lines. So if I go in here, I can pick a different direction. So I simply select an select icon. You can see how it automatically shifts that direction in relevance. So we highlight, let's say, another one of those little circle or one of those slider planes. You can adjust where the slider plane is actually at. It changes the color code. And we can also pick a different direction for that new section line. So you can see how it selects a different section line direction and it basically improves and cleans up the way that the split plane is actually referencing material. So we can actually go into here. You can see how that split plane actually goes into the part. We're changing the direction around as well and it creates a clean opening. So now 
let's say where that is actually going into the part, we can add an additional slider. Pick between two points. And then go ahead and rebuild it. And from that point, let's say that's an area that we don't necessarily want we can turn off the connect automatically and that's going to actually go in and allow us to remove that area. So it's not actually completely closing this off as a relief and shut off surface or if we select connect automatically after we turn off that surface creation, it turns that off and we can focus on a different area. So we can add to that and we can focus on these areas with a different command, like let's say a surfacing type of command, an extrusion type of command. But this makes it so it's a lot easier to create your relief and shut off surfaces very quickly, just by adjusting some of these slider bars, changing the direction of the way the sliders are actually going to be referenced, and changing up the direction for where it's actually going to be trimmed from. So now we'll get into split and split by color. So the two commands have been redeveloped to have the same workflow from one to the other. The icons have been aligned in both commands as well, so you can kind of see how the icons are very similar between the two. Within draft analysis, the interface has also been updated as well. So there's new functionality to this, so you have some new commands such as tooltip info, create labels, and you can also show vertical faces. You can also only display the vertical colors if you wanted to as well. So here's just a quick video. We're going to start off with the draft analysis. So we'll start off with draft analysis, choosing the direction, just like we, how we always did. And you can see how there's a fast preview showing the color ranges. You have a number of ranges. You can increase and decrease them. You can see the color bar on the left shows up instead of right in the dialog. You can display tooltip info. So if you basically select a face, you can see the tooltip info on that face, telling you what the draft angle is. And then when you actually confirm the command, you have the ability to create the label. So the label will display after the fact as well. So you can see how when we select these faces, it displays all the labels for the relevant faces. You can also draw curves and print curves and print curves and uh, show the colors as well, just like how the other draft command worked as well. So you can change the color of vertical faces if you choose to. You have your vertical faces show up as a different color as well, so all your vertical walls are considered as that color face. So again, if we select draw curves, it generates a preview of what the curves are going to look like. If I say imprint in color, and actually when we hit the checkbox to confirm, would actually imprint and color these draft shaded areas. So you can also apply the vertical face color only. So if I check that box and hit preview, it only displays anything as a vertical wall inside of this dialog. The curvature analysis command has also been redeveloped with a cleaner interface. You can also, like with the previous command, display tooltip info and create labels. You can also choose to have a concave or convex face option as well. And there's a brand new command within 2023.1 within analysis called altitude analysis. This command allows you to calculate the altitude of a part. It is possible to draw, imprint, imprint, and color the altitude ranges. You can also show and create labels within this command as well. So here's just a quick video of these two. We'll start with the curvature analysis. So if I go ahead and select the part, you can see how we can display all the curvatures. You can see the color bar on the left side showing the curvature areas within the colors. And you can also show the concave only or the convex only as well. So it changes the color codes in regards to the setting that you show. So I say show all. You can show your optimal distribution range as well. You can turn off flat faces as well. So you can actually display flat faces as their own unique color. You can change when you do optimal distribution. It's going to optimally distribute this all as one entity. So when I say custom, now these values are editable. And I can type in the values. You can see how it changes the colors instantly for the curvature in your model. So as you can see, you can see how the colors are going to change automatically. So if I wanted to, I can pick on these areas, create labels, and when I confirm, I can actually retain these labels within my dialog. So I'm with this, I can also show the label in the minimum radius. So it automatically imprints in the minimum radius area of this part in regards to the curvature. 
So you can see how the arrow actually points at the minimum area, and you can see what your minimum radius is going to be overall. So now we're going to go into the altitude manager. So if we go select this option, or, and then pick our part, you can see how the altitude is going to be displayed. So from zero to whatever the maximum altitude is, you can have it automatically display the labels for the altitude. You can control your label ranges. So you can draw, imprint, imprint, and color these labels onto your part automatically. If I go to show labels, I could actually also create labels as well. So I select draw, it's actually going to create wireframe lines around it. If I select imprint, it actually imprints those edges on there. And then imprint and color automatically does the color coding for you. So we're going to talk about the compare command. This command has been redeveloped as well to create a cleaner user interface between the two parts to make ease of use. So the functionality to show apply analysis only on one solid and both solids has also been added as well. Within query distance, the function has been improved with some new added options and graphic datums. It is now possible to define the direction along to which the calculated distance is. The distance calculation between two planes and two parallel flats or between two points and two flat faces has also been added. In the query command within query distance, this is also applied to the query distance point to point, point to element, point to face, and face to face. So here's just a quick video showing these commands. So we're going to talk about the compare command. So we have two solids here. And if I go to analysis compare, you'll see that the dialog has been vastly improved upon. So we can actually select both solids, and you can see how immediately it goes to just the changes between the two solids. So you can display common areas by checking the box, apply a unique color to the common areas. We can show only the difference between the first body and only the difference between the second body. If we go to results apply on, you can say first body only. You can say second body only as well. So if I select mark edges as relevant, you can actually mark the relevant edges where there's differences between the models. So when I go ahead and confirm, you can see only on the first body that comparison. So now we'll go into query distance and just show some of the new functionality within this. So I'm going to go ahead and pick this edge and this face. And you can actually see how it creates a new graphic datum or a new datum area that displays the distances between those faces. So you can see the minimum distance, you can see maximum distance, and minimum distance to a planar face and distance along a direction. This also displays the labels as well, so if I say keep results, it keeps the results there too. So now we're going to go to this example. We're going to kind of show some of the additional functionality within this as well. So if we go to query distance, we're going to go ahead and select, let's say, the center of this circle to the center of the other circle. So right now, the minimum distance between those circles is displayed here. You can see how the maximum distance is, and you can say distance along direction as well. So you can see where the dialog actually displays. So you can keep results, you can keep different colors for whatever distances that you want, and yeah, you can actually manipulate the chain. So I can select different chain uh, dispositions as well. So you can add witness lines instead of actually the chain, and you can actually display the distance of those lines in the X, Y, Z from here. So going on to our last example, we're actually going to go this time from face to face. And this shows the same type of planes that we see in the initial example. You can see what the minimum distance is between those faces. You could change some of your different settings around. So minimum distance is actually going to draw a line. Maximum distance is going to draw a line. Minimum distance between parallels is going to draw this line. So you can keep the results, you can keep the label in there, and it displays and retains all those lines. Dynamic tooltip within Dynamic Query. The calculation of the geometric properties like volume is performed within a separate thread. So the relevant information like coordinates, attributes are shown immediately, which is, in, which is the second thread which is calculated within geometric properties. So this is now displayed within the Dynamic Query options. Within Query Thickness, you now can display both inches and millimeters so you can flip back and forth between the two. Some new enhancements to Dynamic Section include the ability to define a point of a section that is retained when changing the direction. 
it is now possible to recall the dynamic section during a pick phase of any commands. And there is a new rotation angle option to insert the angle value within the rotation mode. There is a new scaled hatch option. This mode allows you to compute the approximate size of the hatch within the section body. And within Motion Study, you now have the ability to define a roto translation movement. There is also the ability to merge work files that contain defined Motion Study and have all the defined movements update to a new position after being merged. So here's some of the new functionality within Dynamic Section. So if I go into, let's say, Change Attributes, I can actually activate that dynamic section while inside of the change attributes. So this is just simply hitting the X, Y, Z buttons and I'm within change attributes. Previously, I would actually have to select the command, or previously I'd have to be out of the command to be able to use this. So right now, I press X, Y, Z, I'm actually inside the dialog box command that it actually applies the dynamic section. So you can see if I highlight all my different solids, you can see how they're still selectable within the dynamic section too. So now we're going to talk about the dynamic section rotation angle options. So if I select translational right now, I select a defining point for where it's actually going to be rotating from. I'm still in translation right now, but if I select XYZ, I still have the ability to do my move sections and the standard functionality, but I could also do a rotation too. And you can see how I actually have rotation angle, and I could type in an angle in here, and on the fly, it instantly changes that angle to whatever I want. 90 degrees, 45 degrees, etc. And we can also change the scaling for the hatch lines. Right now, it's set to a scaled hatch or scaled hatch with default color. So the hatch lines scale to the part that they're actually being hatched from. So you can see how just a standard hatch, the lines are the same distance. When I do a scaled hatch, anything that's smaller, like these uh, horn pins, are actually displayed with a smaller hatch line. So very nice to be able to see any kind of smaller features and know what size those features actually are. So here's just an example for motion study. This is doing a roto translation when it comes to doing the motion study. So right now, if I do like, let's say a file merge, and I merge in a second file that has motion study defined within it, I just place it somewhere else. I switch to that act to plane as well, and then I merge a third one. This is basically just the same file or merge again, but different planes completely. So going back to motion study, if I hit play, and I go to select any of the other movements, for example, it will automatically recognize the plane and it will do the roto translation in that specific plane after merge. So it's merging in the motion study data within another file. So I'll go ahead and merge another one here as well. And this is also on a completely different plane. So when I go back to motion study, I just choose that study within my motion study area. And if I hit play, you'll see how it's going to also do that rotation as well. And it retains that setting when merging in a file. So some of the new functionality within Bounty Box is basically combining everything into one tab. So the results data has been moved into one tab. It is now also possible to apply a cavity on the calculation of the solid bounding box and create a work plane in relevance to the bounding box as well. So you can basically choose any of the points that are displayed to create a work plane from bounding box. Within solid interference, you now have the ability to apply a color and imprint edges making the, or marking them as relevant for any contacts and intersection areas. There's a new option called hide solids that do not have contact with any parts or intersections with one another. Inside a surface analyzer, you have more consistent information that is portrayed within the surface type and surface features. There's a new dynamic field that has been added to show or diameter values for holes. And here's this quick video showing the bounty box real quick. So let's just select our part and you can see how we have our collapsed windows you can actually create work planes and it will automatically show points in relevance to the work plane areas. So you could actually choose 
the point by a drop down here. So you could do at maximum Z, automatically creating a work plane at maximum Z. You could do a standard at minimum Z and just pick a point, pick a position for where you want that to be displayed. So if I go to all, it shows all of my points. If you go to at maximum Z, it shows all maximum Z points. You can also say ignore offsets or activate that work plane after it's already created. So within this offset area, you can actually apply an offset to. And these work plane relevance automatically do this. If I say ignore the offset, it actually ignores that offset and goes back to the original position. So if I select create work plane, it'll actually create a work plane where I can give that work plane a name right from the bounty box. So it saves time if I ever have to make a work plane. I don't have to apply points. It just applies a work plane where I want it to be applied to. So now we'll talk about the solid interference command. So selecting all these additional areas, if I go to select the solid interference box, you can see all the contact faces, all the collision faces, green and red. I can show interference zones and I can only show interference zones if I wanted to. I can say hide non-intersecting faces, so it unchecks any solids that are not intersecting as well, so I can just specify what I want to see and what I don't. I can do only intersections and do the same type of hiding. I can display all, and I can apply this information as well. So now we're going to see what's new within the Electro module. So within the electrode command, the command has been redeveloped for ease of use and better functionality. So there are a few new options within this. One of them is total height. So this field allows you to show what the total height is for the electrode tip. So you can also create a by solid box for the electro, which creates a solid box for the electro, basically using bounding box on the selected faces. The cavity operation allows you to cavity this workpiece without the need of actually using the cavity command to do this. This allows you to create the shape of the erosion area for the electrode to be created. And some angular information is available on the rotation, which is calculated from the bounding box as well. So here's just a quick video just showing you how the new electrode command works. So we've got this little spot right here for we're going to create an electrode. So if I go to electrode, electrode, and I select the faces of where I want the electrode burn to be based off of, I choose the direction and the burn piece. It creates a solid box off of it automatically. So right now we're doing it by solid. If I select by vertical, if I select by linear, it does not work. But by box in this specific situation allows you to create that area. I could do a translation of this so I can preview what it looks like. So it's basically like a slider to show how this part is actually going to slide in and create the electrode burn. So right now I can see all the yellow faces are marked as my contact faces. So you can see how it creates that electrode specifically off of this area and I can adjust the height of this to actually add some additional height. So if I go ahead and confirm this, it'll create that electrode. So let's look at an additional spot right here. So I'll select the faces for this one right here. Pick the direction, pick the collision piece, and this time I can actually use a vertical or a linear as well. I can do angular information too, so I'm going to adjust the height of this real quick. I can adjust the depth of this. What it's going to do is it'll automatically create a cavity for me instantly. And then I could do my transformation as well. So you can see how it automatically creates a cavity for me of that specific electrode when we're doing our burning. So I can confirm that, and that's another electrode that's been created. So if I want to isolate that electrode, you can see there's the actual electrode itself. I can still model it up. I can still do some cleanup work off of this as well. But that's the basic shape of the electrode. So like, like right now, let's do some cleanup work. I'm just using edit face to do so, and I can edit that face. So I can adjust the stock to move it up, and I just have my burn position area cleaning up the model just a little bit. I can also use what is called replace face with surface. I can select these faces, and I can just say, okay, from here, I want the offset of that to be a, of a certain position. So I can set the offset value for that, and it'll actually make that 
actually a flat area. So I'm doing an offset from the top. I'm making a flat area for my electrode. And basically this would be the finished electrode with the stock applied and what needs to be burned. So the electro electrode makes it a lot easier to actually create an electrode for burn position. So with an electrode stock, there is an option to apply colors to the contact faces and mark the edges as relevant where the erosion data is selected. Within the electrode axis management, there are some options to swap X and Y to easily have the combination of an X and Y direction. It is also possible to load a holder and automatically place the holder as the electrode origin by pressing the Enter key. There is also an option to say load holder from Electrode Manager. When you're loading a holder, there is a new option to be able to create the origin as holder reference for the or origin position. So for those of you that create a holder with the origin set to the feet of the holder, this will add that option. In the electrode position in the EDM settings to define the number of decimal place values, you would have to put in a zero integer for the position for it to round to the filling numbers. The option to define trailing places in order to have the three values for X, Y, Z would be the same number of places. So within here, we're going to show how the electrode stock enhancements have worked. So we're going to select two solids, we're going to select the collision piece, and it applies that electrode stock to that. So you can see how you can actually put in whatever distance that you want. You can create a heel off this full holder and increase the height for that heel as well. So it adds a stock and adds a heel to that as well. So there's a simple checkbox within the origins to be able to swap X and Y. So you can do the swapping from the default axis option here, or just apply a checkbox, which automatically does that as well. So you can see how the work plane swaps just by a simple checkbox. So you can swap the X and Y, and it makes it easier to do so. So if we go ahead and confirm this one, apply the work plane, it applies that work, work plane here. So now we're going to go into holders from stock. So I'm going to go ahead and select my electrode, select my part. I'm going to go ahead and place that area right here. Change the height of the stock itself. Set that as transparent. Go ahead and select any options here so you can see how we'll set it to bottom right now. Stock bottom face and top. So you see how you have your different settings in there. Now, if I go to holders from library, I can actually insert in a holder. This only works with the holders that are automatically in the software. So unfortunately, at the present time, any custom holders that are made, this option will not be applied. So if I use this drop down, I can select holder reference. It automatically puts that holder at the feet of the, elect of the actual electro holder itself. So if I go ahead and apply, I don't have to manually apply that position. So I'll go into some of the new features within the Electro Manager. Inside the report field, there is a total length, including the holder for outputting this information. The status of the options for the context menu is retained within the current fizzy session. You also have the ability to do a four-sided mirror when you're using the Create Mirrored Copies option within Electro Manager. The confirmation of the stock is no longer present in naming the mirrored area as the prefix would show up as a star and is shown within the two mirrored copied areas. So now we're going to go into what is new within the CAM general interface. So we're going to start with work plane vis er, visualization. So you can display the work plane name and it'll show the name of the CAM setup on the actual work plane right next to it. So it's easier to identify. With text colors between light and dark background, it is actually easier to see the text as the text color automatically changes to make it easier to read, regardless of the background color that you have selected. Within toolpath colors, it is now possible to define your toolpath colors for approach, retract, rapid colors, and feed colors. 
within CAM tool sheets. There's been some improvements for managing the master template of these tool sheet selections. There's a new function within CAM settings to be able to achieve this. So we'll just display the work play names real quick. So I'm going to create a couple of setups. And very similarly to how we can display work play names within what we was shown previously within the interface area, you can actually change and show these work play names here. So I'm just customizing the work play names to what we want. And then we go to system settings under the graphics area, show work play names. You can see how these work play names display on the screen. So as you can see, they do rotate around and it's easier to make the display. So you could also display the coordinates of these work planes as well. So you can see the actual coordinates and the angles of these coordinates as well. So right now, if I go ahead and turn on the show output angles, you can see how the labels update with that relevant information as well. So we can now show the toolpath lab, the color changes. So the color change ability allows you to better see what your toolpaths look like. So you can show the rapids, you can show different things. And we can actually customize the color of each one of these items to make them more bold, to make them a different color. Like for example, bright pink and screaming at you. And you can see the difference between the visualizations. There have been some new updates to the add operation dialog as well. So within the add op operations dialog within the extended mode inside the Visi interface, there's new easier selection areas. So the toolpaths have been grouped into different categories for three axes, standard, export, or expert, and superseded. So within here, this would uh, affect the 2D, 3D, and wire operations. You also, or so the drilling and drill cycles have not been changed. And when you're doing the expert and unsupported list, you need the extended mode to be turned on under the system setting user interface. This was mentioned previously. So when you click on the main folder listed in the reset standard area, the operation folders look like this. So we have in the three axis area, you have a expert and you have a superseded uh, tab. These are the new icons right here. So here's your expert tab. These are some of the available operations within that. And then here's your superseded options right here as well. So as you can see, you still have all of the operations. They're just not all thrown into the same queue. So it's subdivided. It's just in different queues. So talking about the uh, extended mode within CAM, there have been several different things that have been updated. So again, system settings, user interface, there's extended mode inside that option. So basically here are some of the differences when you do not have the extended mode turn on and off. So you can see here's just some of the drop downs that are different between one area and the other. Here's another picture just showing some of the differences here. And we're going to get into some of the toolpath reporting. As mentioned before, there is a new, there have been multiple improvements, including a new section inside the camp settings area. So there's an area inside of camp settings that now lets you control some of the defaults for the reporting, such as file extensions, such as location where it's being placed at, and so on. So within the model manager add piece at stock and obstacle, this is now named the component management instead of piece management. You have the same functionality that you had previously. So you can still add a piece, add a stock, add an obstacle. It's just now instead of being named piece management, it's now component management. So here's just a quick video just overviewing some of this. So we'll start off the toolpath reporting. So under CAM settings, there is a new tool report or toolpath report tab. So you have defaults for your milling and you have defaults for your wire operations as well. So you can set the default where the reports being pulled to, what type of report extension is going to be by default, as well as locations and output names. So you can actually choose a report here and it would overall set that default report. Within the report options, you can also control the default, whether it's going to run off of the post processor, you can choose the names, whether it's user defined, you specify the name under output name, and you actually have a simple checkbox to generate this report after posting or not. So we're going to talk about assembly feature patterns. 
This is a new option that allows you to reassemble a dissolve pattern group and allows you to identify manual features that have been created. This new option is available in the right click context menu when you select the multi selection of features. This option works on 2D features, wire features, and whole features. Individual identifier features can be added to an existing pattern using a drag and drop from a parent group. And this is the option right here. So just show a quick video of this here. So I'm just going to run recognition on a few of these entities. Pair set first, run recognition. Basically let's scan for these features. So within here, you can see how it shows all of these different features. It has some of them grouped, it has some of them that are not grouped. So we'll just select some of these complex open pockets here. We can go to add assembly pattern. Basically what this does is it throws, the, throws these into a group to be able to have them show up in a group, basically reducing the list of features inside of the model manager tab. So this works well with group names as well. So if we created a group folder in here too, we can actually subdivide these assemblies into that group folder as well. So now we're going to look at these list of pockets here. This works great. So for example, if I have this list of pockets and I right click and I say dissolve pattern, it'll dissolve those into separate pockets. So let's say I want the pockets of this set here to be part of an assembly. I can reassemble those into a grouped assembly. I can basically subdivide these up or I can select multiple ones and actually do a drag and drop. So right now I could set these as its own assembly. I expand these out or I could do a drag and drop. So right now, if I go ahead and select all of those, I just drag and drop to the existing assembly and it will actually drag and drop these into that existing assembly. So we're going to talk about what's new within the feature recognition. So there have been several different enhancements that have been used within this. So feature results are now definable under the piece. So this helps with identifying which feature results are related to a specific piece when running the recognition. It is now possible to define the recognition under the piece, which will actually create a sub branch within the piece that shows all the features associated to it. So it can expand and collapse those features based on the piece. This will help group together the AFR that has been run on different models when the AFR is run when there is no piece selected in the UI. So the traditional method is still available for the AFR scan. Basically, if you just run recognition, it will basically create a recognition folder within the model manager, which just shows a broad scheme of all the features found. Add boss by silhouette is now run under the AFR within feature recognition. So this option is in the standard UI for the AFR scan when you're using run recognition and it is available. So you no longer have to use the reference boss by silhouette. You just choose the reference direction and it will create it right from the interface. So here's the icon within the automatic recognition options. And here are some of the settings that control the defaults for this. So there is a new feature called reference name, which is a CAD based feature, but it's been expanded or expanded to cam, which is a very nice feature for helping us do some references. So you can use the change attributes command inside of the CAD area to be able to add reference names. So this allows you to define things such as profiles, pieces, stock, obstacles, etc., with the reference name parameters. You can utilize this reference name within the save operation templates. So you can utilize the reference name for any geometry used for a boundary for element attributes, and this can be saved within the template. With the following new options, it is now possible to save this within a template. So if you have a new work file that has these same reference names in it, it will define the template based on these reference names. So when you're doing this, the option for this or the option, as long as it has the same name, will not prompt you to pick another, let's say, wireframe or profile boundary. So when running the template, if there's no matching reference names for the geometry, Visi will automatically ask you to manually input the geometry. But if the reference name is there, it'll automatically pick it up when you're doing a save operation template. When you're using the reference names, it'll show in brackets the reference names next to the feature. 
So this actually, for example, with profile cam attributes, makes it very easy to differentiate the actual profile cam attributes. Same thing for features, same thing for faceless, same thing for everything. So it makes it very nice to be able to see exactly what geometry you're using. So you just use the CAD base feature within change attributes, you input the data there, and if you save it as an operation template, save it as a profile cam attribute, it will allow you to differentiate it. So now we're going to go into what's new within the two axis features. So we'll start out with the pocketing. So transition between features. There's a new behavior within the pocketing routine. So previously when you did translation between features, it would create an equal and optimized link within the generation near the clearance plane or feed rate. With the new behavior, the toolpath generates without the unnecessary return to clearance plane, so it creates the pockets before moving on to another pocket. So if the old operator in the old operation within feature equals to optimize, it will be necessary to rebuild the toolpath to correct this feature. So if you have this saved in an old area, you would have to correct it. So the new low translation or translation movements are now executed within the rapid feeds, but at translation or translation feeds or transition feeds, the user can now set the operation cutting clearance. So here's just a quick video kind of showing this. So this is the old version. You can see here's our original pocketing routines. Here's the pockets that we're kind of talking about. You see how we have the retracts that go all the way up to the top of the clearance planes for this. There's multiple ones between each of the features. So when we go in, you can see all the different levels, the different uh, Z patterns. It's transitioning to the top of the clearance plane or uh, top of the features. So you can see how each step is going through that process. So basically looking at the 2023 operations right now, you can see how the retract has been substantially reduced. So it recognizes where the features are in the depths and it limits the amount of retracts to the top of the feature or the top of the clearance planes. Another new feature within the pocketing command is the keep looping when cutting through thin chips. There's a new option such as this. This option is activated when the chip prevention is on. Basically, when you're doing a waveform toolpath, this option will adjust to avoid hard cutting on thin chipped walls. So this improvement will extend the tool's life and avoid critical cutting conditions. The option again, keep looping when cutting through thin chips. So here's just a couple pictures. So this is an example of the critical area, and this is a tool path that it would actually create from this. Within chamfering operation, you now have the ability to use protect geometry. This new function within the chamfering operation can be used for the chamfer to check against the modeled piece. And the new engines now avoid gouging the piece between the tool and the holder. The protect geometry allows it's allowed only when the chamfer is modeled with a solid piece. The system will automatically switch this on and off when you have a solid piece automatically defined. And the user can force this option for the opposite conditions. So here's just an image of that, just showing some of the results. Note, without protect geometry, the holder check for the trimming with the obstacle can be a rapid movement when selecting geometry. We have optimized safety checking as well. Inside of the pocketing, profiling, and remachining operations, the safety check controls the gouge between 3D geometry, the tool assembly, and is automatically skipped. In the previous versions, the gouge checking would be done during the toolpath computation. And this, or this means this will reduce the time of the build for the operations within these areas. So this is done when, or this does not compromise the toolpath during the results. So you can see during the area management, this is where it's doing the toolpath checking and protection of geometry. So in this instance, it saves you about 25 seconds within the build time. The build times can vary due to the complexity of the piece, stock, geometry, and so on. So now we're going to go over what is new within the three and five axis cam operations. So we'll start off with the default clearance plane offsets. The default clearance plane offset is now applied to all three axis operations and is now definable through the cam settings. This value is then added to the maximum Z value of the piece and is used for the clearance plane within the three axis tool paths. 
Within the roughing operations, we have convex tool tips. The, co the convex tool tip is now accepted within 3-axis roughing operations that manage the tools for theoretical tools. The dynamic stock, the rest material calculation, and kinematics manage the real tool shape. So continuing on with 3-axis, the, there is a new option called slope angle color management. Inside of all tool paths, this is an option that will now work with angled values. So in this option, it will generate a graphical preview of the angle ranges before the tool path is actually calculated. This default color palette can be defined within the cam settings, but can also be defined on the fly within a command while you're actually creating the dynamic update. So here's just an image of it. There will be a video showing this a little bit later. So within finishing standard, you now have the definable tool paths. So when you're using finishing standard, the tool path is used within the methods for raster, spiral, radial, morph, or projection. So you can now set these to use standard raster, standard spiral, standard radial, and standard morphing. So you can see here's just uh, some of the options within this. And here's just a quick video example showing you some of these examples. So we'll talk about the color slope management. So you can see how there's a slope management area. This has always existed, but there's actually a new icon. So you can actually type in these vari variables to show you what your minimum maximum ranges are. And you can actually select this icon and it actually color codes all the faces with that specific angular range. You can change the colors of these faces and set this to a customizable area. So you can actually see what your management is. Here's where you can change on the fly. So you can start making some adjustments to this. You can start to see all the relevant changes. So you can see everything between one degree and 60 degrees for your slope management. So you can actually set these values. You can preview what the colors are before you even generate the tool path. So you know exactly what is going to be cut within that management area. So we're going to go to what's new with the three to five axis operations. So we're going to start out with the entry and exit feeds. So for three to five axis options, it will now automatically relink the three axis input to ensure the links are fully protected. There is a new retract option for shortest way, minimum distance, safety distance, and clearance plane, along with the definable approach and retract distances. So within three to five axis, there's also a new option for point distribution. So it will now automatically apply distribution filters on the points to remove unwanted filters or unwanted points as comparison to 2022.1. So here's just a couple of images just kind of showcasing what the differences are. So now we'll get, go into the Wire EDM software. What's new with Wire EDM and Visi 2023.1? So we'll start with triangle attachments. This is a new option within the wire EDM tab to remove the waste without the need to cut mechanically. This option will generate a small triangle attachment of material that would be allowed to manually knock out the remaining slug. The option allows you the reduction in machine time for waste of material. There are three types of attachments. You have a parallel, a lower triangle, and an upper triangle attachment. The triangle approach is managed on arcs, and normally it's better to use this option on segments to avoid a micro gouge and to the piece, but the micro gouge normally is removed by the finishing step. Users can also set the desired dimension for the triangle results for the attachments. And no, kinematics does not show the simulation of the mechanical waste removal. Normally, the waste removal will be cut by the finishing pass. So here's just a quick video showing the new feature. So if I go to the properties of the wire operation, this would be under the tagging tab. So we use our drop down here, select manual waste removal, and then we've got this waste removal where you can select either Lower triangle, you could choose a distance of how far it's going out as well as the triangle height. So you can see the distance here. You can choose where the triangle is actually going to be, whether it's a parallel, whether it's a lower triangle, or whether it's an upper triangle. So this material or this is going to add this into the operation so that way you have an area to knock out for the slug. So now we're going to go into another new option. This is called Force 2 Axis NC Output. 
So there's a new option in the Wire Toolpath Programming Planes tab that allows you to force two axis in C output. Visi out, or Visi Wire outputs four axis if there was a gouge situation or a corner method that was not achievable for some users. It is preferably or is preferable to use two axis output for this reason and an improvement flag to force this type of output has been added. The two axis NC output manages easier geometry compared to four axis. For example, the AC Millennium machine model, the start or the same start geometry in four axis requires 607 blocks, where in two axis it only requires 50 blocks. The new flag is grayed out when it is not possible to manage geometry as two axis NC output. The function only runs when the operation parameter to use this option is enabled. So for example, if you have the taper setting, it has to be disabled. We'll go into multi-start hole files. Now the machine configuration has a parameter that allows a user to automatically use two different start holes using two different templates. The save time posting, or this saves time posting, as it means it no longer is necessary to run the post processor twice to change the start hole template. We have multiple origin management. In this version, it or better manages multiple pieces. Where wire paths can be operated and cut by CAM setups or projects. Within the operation parameters, the user can choose the sort of cuts to optimize the working cycle. And the user can create all the operation cuts on a CAM setup, sort of, or sorting them by the following criteria defined within the operation parameters. Now there is a uh, tag remove ordering method option within the CAM setup settings as well. So we'll just show a couple videos here. So this is the multi workpiece management. So you can see how you'd have different CAM setups for different wire operations. So if I go to the properties within this operation, I could use like, let's say a coordinate system, like a 54, 55, 56, and I can manage that right through the properties here. So within the wire cut area, I can actually change my wire tagging method to roughing the camps or roughing of this camp setup. So within kinematic simulation, you can see how it actually outputs off of these different setups as well. So you can see how it cuts this first one first. You can choose to remove all the tags, everything that you need off of that. And then it will automatically go to the next block and cut the next block as well. So it will continue this process as a, for as many blocks as you want, as many steps as you want. So there's a new option called Create and Climb Machine with X, Y translation or angles. This command is useful for easily creating a toolpath for a seat for slider pins and using straight features. It is generally necessary to create a 4-axis feature to set up the approach, retract, start endpoints up and down to achieve this desired result. With this option, it only is needed to set the straight geometry because the new operation parameters generates the 4-axis geometry toolpath. The XY offset and the XY angle can be applied in values that are positive and negative. The ability to set these approach and retract circle points are available. So here's just an image showing all of that. The user can generate a vertical thread or a threaded wire with the same inclination of the cut as well. So here's just an example of that. So within the Mitsubishi G54 PXX coordinate output system, there has been some changes. So the post processor can change to two different methods to call the piece and the origin. The standard method appends to the number of defined CAM setups to the NC output datum number. Generally, G54. 54 is the number from the wire output. Replacing it with 55, 56, and 57 would output G55, 56, and 57, respectively.
The new option defines the machine setup's outputs the number from the wire cam setup as an alternate way of managing the datum offsets for the G54P numbers. Where the wire cam setup number of is appended in the NC file for the P value of the G54. The cam setup index could be printed in the NC file with two different systems. So here's just an image just showing you some of the different setups for that. So within technology offsets, the number of technology offsets have been increased from 12 to 15 in the technology operations parameters. Within machine model selection, in previous versions when a user would change the technology file in the machine configurations to update the list of available machine models, it was necessary to close the machine configuration and reopen it. In this version, this is no longer necessary. Here's just a quick video just showing you that. So you can see how we go to the properties here. You go to select a machine. You can see how it's blank right now. If I go to further options and I choose, let's say, a different database file, I select the machine, it still is not selected. So I actually have to close out of the configuration file after changing that directory. And then select in the machine file. And you can see how my machine populates. In 2023, this is no longer necessary to do, as you just change the directory and it automatically updates so you can actually just select the database file. So if I go to change the directory of an MDB, I no longer have to close and reopen it. So I go back to options after selecting the new DB and it's there. Avoid stop before the cutting tag. When there is a cut feature as performed with cut tags at end of feature, users can choose where they want to generate the stop before the start of the tag cut. This prevents early interaction by the user when it comes to a very long tag. If the cut tag at end of feature is selected, tag removal method, a start point is generated after the last finishing and before the tag cut. The whole re or the reason for the stop of the wire is we do not want to go back to the start hole when using the tag method cut at end of feature. Most users prefer this. However, in some cases with larger tags, this can be used and you can skip this stop point. The tagging tab requires a restyle with this new option. So here's some images of the dialog example, and here's the uh, new layout for the tag tab. Here's just a quick video just showing this. So you can see how we actually go ahead and select our wire point right here. So if you see where your tag is, you can see where the start area is as well. If I go to turn off this operation and I go to show it, you can see how it creates a different start tag or different point when we're using the new tag features. So you can say stop tag before removal. You can say start it with the removal. And basically what that does is going to generate that circle point. And thanks for watching. I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor to question and answer. Appreciate everybody's time and thank you again.